Welcome PCS members and friends to our today's uh, IBS PCS seminar. It is a great pleasure uh, today to have with us uh, Professor Claudio Castelnovo from uh, University of Cambridge. And I would like to invite our scientific host, Alexei, to introduce our speaker. Please, Alexei. Yeah, uh, thanks, Tillen. So um, our today's speaker is, Tillen has already announced, is Claudio Castelnovo from the University of Cambridge. He's going to talk about localization and transport in many body to the quasi-periodic models. Uh, so Claudio received his PhD um, at Boston University in 2006, and then moved to Oxford, where he was a postdoc. He was a postdoc, uh, a postdoc, and then um, he received an EPSRC um, fellowship. And then uh, he moved to the Royal Holloway University um, for two years, where he was first a lecturer and then a senior lecturer. And since 2012, he uh, is at the University of Cambridge, where since 2020, he's a full professor. And so he's uh, working in the field of condensed matter with interests in frustrated magnetism, many body systems and localization. And Claudio, with this, please, the screen is all yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for the very kind uh, introduction and invitation uh, to give a talk uh, at your institute. Um, Sadly, remotely is uh, um, well. This is one of the advantages of this modern world. I would, I suppose, um, traveling long distances would be more complicated, and this is a, a red, more ready, uh, readily available way to uh, fill that gap and that distance. And it's a pleasure to give this this presentation. This is um, I, I will tell you a story about this. Uh, two strange phenomena: localization and transport. Strange in the sense that they typically don't. Uh, live in the same system. And I'll try to convince you that they actually can in uh, many body two-dimensional quasi-periodic um, models. This was work done um, really spearheaded and uh, carried out by uh, Antonio Strahl, who is uh, the person actually on the right in the photo, um, who is a, a Swiss National Science Foundation fellow um, here in Cambridge working with me and also with Elmer uh, uh, Doggen. Um, there is an archive reference uh, there, and actually on the same topic and around about the same time, just before and just after our archive, two further works um, came out uh, that I mentioned uh, in the slide. The first one is by Anusha Chandran's group at Boston. Uh, sorry, the first one is by Sarang Gopalakrishnan uh, group, formerly at Penn, now at Princeton. And uh, the second one is by Anusha Chandran's group uh, at Boston um, University. Um, before I actually start with the talk, let me spend a couple of minutes on this first slide. And if it doesn't move, it's not a technical error. It's actually, I want to talk on this slide uh, first to give a little bit of a flavor of motivation of what we did, what we decided to do, and um, the punchline of the talk. And then we'll go through uh, all the details um, together uh, with the remaining time. So the phenomenon of localization is, is an exquisite um, quantum mechanical effect um, that I probably don't need to introduce to this uh, group, and I don't mean to uh, put too many details, but just to give a flavor, it is the phenomenon whereby, um, at least in its early formulation by Anderson, at the single particle level, uh, a particle that is hopping, say, on a lattice, um, in presence of disorders, changes its nature dramatically due to interference effects, rather than the conventional plane wave type states uh, that are delocalized across the system, the presence of disorder gives rise to destructive interference and exponentially decaying tails uh, to the uh, particle wave function, whereby the particle can become now localized. And every energy level is, in fact, uh, localized on a, what we, we can refer of on a finite support of the lattice beyond which the exponential tails, tails suppress uh, the probability of seeing the particle. Um, this is quite uh, remarkable, but it was generally believed that uh, as soon as one adds more particles and if uh, they interact with one another, they would be able to destabilize uh, this interference effect leads to um, and, and restore transport as well as thermalization. It was only in, in more recent years that this was brought into uh, more serious consideration and question, and the possibility of actually having many body localization arrows. And it was uh, at least in one dimension and in um, 
specific cases, under specific conditions, one can demonstrate that it's true quantum particles that are interacting and in presence of disorder can exhibit a fully localized spectrum a situation that was termed as many body localization. Doing calculations in this setting is, of course, very difficult. And um, um, sorry, I was just keeping an eye on the chat as well. Um, this is doing calculations. In this case is very difficult. 1D is, is our early port of call. Higher dimensions um, become more challenging uh, to look into. And uh, so the existence of manual radicalization in higher dimensional systems remained. Uh, a matter of debate for uh, for another long uh, time. Um, why are people interested in it? Besides the obvious fundamental uh, uh, aspect of understanding this phenomenon, understanding how it comes to pass, whether it survives in, high, in higher dimensions, etc., uh, and being exquisitely quantum, exquisitely quantum mechanical, as uh, has its uh, uh, interest of its own right. Um, there are also more practical. Uh, uh, um, there is a more practical appeal to this. Um, if we think about it, the fact that um, you have localized wave function, it means that you can actually store information and protect quantum coherence uh, better than a delocalized system. And typically, if you prepare a quantum state, it will communicate with the rest of the system and with the bath in a way that will typically spoil uh, phase coherence and allow the system to relax and we lose information. Um, one attempt to try and protect this was to isolate the systems from the environment very heavily, like um, isolated ions. Another attempt was uh, topological properties that are uh, not affected by uh, local baths, but they are stored uh, non-locally. And many body localization achieves it in a different way by taking um, the wave functions of the system and making them localized on a, on a final por finite portion um, of the lattice or of the system in general. Um, means that they don't talk to one another very effectively and they don't talk to the boundaries of the system very effectively. So you can actually perhaps store information in these systems for uh, long term, uh, for long times. Uh, and that was very appealing. And that drove the, the research, both fundamental, as I said, and the applied aspect in understanding higher um, dimensional uh, fate of many body localization. Um, the most recent consensus uh, in my understanding of the field um, is through um, some of the developments that came about in um, the last five years or so, uh, spearheaded by the Rook and uh, collaborators, um, where they show that actually uh, in higher dimensional disorder is uh, has a pathological flaw. If you introduce disorder in a system that is completely random, there will be a probability of having a finite probability, however small, of having a region that is uh, of weak enough disorder. This region will be, if we assume that this region is able to thermalize, then it will act as an internal bath for the other degrees of freedom in an, what's termed avalanche mechanism that will eventually destroy thermalization. And so in disordered system, the leading belief at the moment is that through this avalanche mechanism, uh, two or higher dimensional uh, systems are not stable. The avalanche mechanism fails in one dimension and allows MBL um, to exist there. So this is the leading um, belief at the moment, and that's motivating the first part of, of our story. Um, the reason why we looked at uh, two-dimensional uh, quasi-periodic models. So we want to understand the fate of localization in higher dimensions. And instead of using disorder, we use quasi-periodic uh, um, potentials. Why quasi-periodic? Oh, no, sorry, we... sorry to interrupt. Uh, can you just comment on why the uh, avalanche mechanism uh, is failing in 1D? Um, I will actually in a couple of slides. If you, if you don't mind delaying that Thank question, I'll, I'll try to answer it there. Uh, actually, I have a slide that shows how, how it works. Thank you. Um, I, at the moment, I just want to give a qualitative so that I can get to the, the, the appeal of what we have been asking. Um, but but I, I will address that. Um, bear with me for a moment. So that's the reason uh, why we... Excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, we are still seeing the first slide. Yes, it, correct. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so that's the reason for quasi-periodic uh, potentials. Um, we quasi-periodic potentials don't repeat ever in, in, in space. They, 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 um, 
they are random looking in that sense, but they're also hyper uniform. And in fact, this is the uh, main theme of the two papers that I mentioned below by uh, uh, Goparatrishnan's group and uh, Chandran's group. Um, they argue that if you choose a proper quasi-periodic model uh, potential that has no rare regions, then you, you don't, the avalanche mechanism at least is not active and therefore MBL has a chance to survive. What Antonio had the idea to do is actually to, to use a different type of quasi-periodic potentials instead, where um, you don't completely suppress the rare regions, but you make them one dimension less the dimension of your system. You can actually choose your quasi-periodic potentials so that you have weak potential lines, so for, insta for instance, embedded in 2D. And the beautiful story that came of it with a quite uh, extensive numerical study that I will present in this talk is that actually many body localization and transport can coexist in this system up to reasonably large, meaning experimentally relevant system sizes and uh, reasonably long time scales. Um, what happens in the thermodynamic limit and in the infinite time limit remains a matter of debate and I'll, I'll, I'll close on that. Okay, sorry, that was a long introduction, but I wanted to explain why we, we went to look into this question and what's exciting about it. This coexistence of localization and transport reminds me of, and I apologize if the analogy is a little bit loose, but reminds me of the idea of super solidity. Uh, super solids having a crystalline structure that, uh, you know, holds shear, but at the same time allow transport, uh, flow, flow, like um, frictionless transport across. Okay, so um, without further ado, I will spend a moment introducing the key concepts of many body localization in amongst which uh, the avalanche mechanism that um, I will use um, that, that I mentioned just to give it as a context and then introduce the notion of quasi-periodic systems before we get to the body of the talk where we uh, will go through the uh, study of the 2D Oberon day models, the quasi-periodic systems that we have studied. Um, they come in two flavors, separable and non-separable. Um, and I'll discuss the subtle differences between the two, but in fact, both exhibit these weak potential lines and we will see evidence of localization uh, and contrast with the case of disorder, uh, where we do see evidence that the localization is failing. Um, and then we will see what, in what sense they support transport as well, and how the two can coexist, at least as our um, numerical uh, methods evidence. And finally, I'll come back to this underlying closing question that, you know, in, in the infinite uh, time thermodynamic limit, um, it's, it remains not obvious uh, what these systems will uh, do. Uh, although there is a chance that they will thermalize eventually, but at least experimentally large timescales and system sizes um, see the coexistence of many body localization and transport. Okay, so the next slide will be the avalanche, but just as a background, what's um, many body localization? I mean, it, it, in classical systems, we are accustomed to, if you layer, for example, two different fluids and you wait in time, eventually they form a, um, a completely uniform mixture. The information that you stored in your system by having the two separated uh, fluids uh, is completely lost in the long time limit. Um, the system thermalizes. At the classical level, it's easy to understand this um, from different perspectives of uh, uh, coupling to a bath and dissipation and relaxation of energies. It's not equally uh, easy. I mean, in this case, we have the Brownian motion of particles, diffusive behavior and thermalization is, 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 is clearly understood. It's not immediately clear what happens in closed quantum systems because now your um, dynamical equation go from diffusive um, to, um, if you want, to, to ballistic or linear. And in that case, understanding thermalization took a bit longer and more effort in the literature. And I think one of the most um, modern and accepted formulations is this eigenstate thermalization hypothesis that, uh, for instance, can be formulated in different ways. But for instance, if you have a closed system and you take a portion A within it, the reduced density matrix of A, once you trace it about the remaining of the system, uh, is well captured by a Boltzmann factor um, that we would expect in thermal equilibrium for some characteristic temperature beta, and it's uh, the same um, wherever you pick this portion A. Um, this is the fate of most systems um, that have extended states. Um, calculations suggested in the uh, uh, thermalization hypothesis holds 
quite generally with rare exceptions some of them are exactly solvable models with uh, conserved quantities of course conserved quantities give you quantum numbers that uh, don't ever relax um, but another example is many body localization um, or localization in general um, as I mentioned uh, talking over the, the, the first slide uh, the disorder can lead to the localization of particles and can in many body case uh, survive interactions and this leads to ergodicity breaking and therefore the uh, eigenstate thermalization hypothesis fails and uh, information persists uh, indefinitely. The typical scenario, which will be useful in fact for the, some of the measures that we will do later is that if you have a one dimensional chain uh, and you prepare it for instance in some uh, initial density wave that is shown here on the left uh, where every other site is occupied and every other uh, is empty, uh, and then you let it evolve. Is this is, if the system is ergodic? If the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian are delocalized, in the long time limit, you expect this to relax um, to some uh, uniform density. On the other hand, if you have in presence of disorder, um, if the particles don't talk to one another because of Anderson localization, or if they are actually uh, interacting because of many body localization, you expect a long time, in principle, infinite time memory of the initial state. And so it will evolve slightly, but you will remain maintain an imbalance between the even and odd sites on the chain. This notion of imbalance is a measure uh, that is often used to check for localization and it's a measure we will use. You can understand it as a staggered density measurement or equivalently a, an overlap between the final state and the initial state. However you think about it, it's not too difficult to quantify um, the, this, this notion and distinguish the ergodic from localized case. Okay, in 1D, this was shown, demonstrated, understood uh, reasonably uh, extensively, and it was quickly also seen in experiments, which is uh, where it's not too difficult to introduce disorder, say in an optical lattice. Um, the, um, the thin line on the left here is, is this um, optical lattice uh, that can be created disordered in uh, mm -hmm. uh, cold atomic systems. Mm -hmm. um, the finite barriers between the valleys lead to um, some hopping J mm -hmm. between them. Um, the fact that the depth vary means you have different zero point energies that give you a random on-site uh, potential for these particles. And the standard type of interactions, for instance, Coulomb, uh, give you a um, repulsive uh, U that gives you a higher energy cost if you have two particles in a well, um, or in general, actually. Yeah, anyway, um, there are different mechanisms to realize this U. Um, and therefore, you have interacting particles in one dimension in presence of disorder. You can prepare easily the state that we discussed, which is a staggered um, density wave shown top right. And then you can measure the imbalance as a function of time, which is the bottom uh, panel. Um, and you can start with the case of delta over j equals zero. Delta is our, um, sorry, this delta was the measure of the disorder and j is the hopping. Um, at time zero, the imbalance is one. Experiments can't really measure ever exactly zero times, so they're slightly off one. And then they see a sudden uh, uh, decay uh, and then a plateau that survives to long times. But delta over j, this plateau is at zero. So the imbalance dies off immediately. When, as soon as they turn on disorder and it reaches a certain uh, uh, value, you can see that the uh, decay is stunted and then it stops and hovers uh, on a, at a value that is uh, appreciably constant over the time scale of the experiment. And this works for different values of the interaction new. Um, this was done also in two dimensions. Um, maybe it's not uh, as, uh, as useful to go through the details of this experiment in, 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 uh, in as, um, as, as, as carefully, but practically one can obtain again an imbalance versus time and this decay. However, notice that the situation is a little less clear cut. Uh, in, let me flip back in 1D, the, sub, the initial decay is well separated in time from the plateau and one can assess the two separately. Um, in 2D, even though they can access much larger times, the decay is much smoother. And so if one looks at the highest disorder case, which is the blue top here, uh, distinguishing whether that has an initial decay and then a constant plateau, or if it's only a single decay down becomes subtle. 
Uh, and therefore, we can't use experiments to make definitive calls in higher dimensions. And numerics also are a bit challenged, so the, the, remain, the, the matter remained uh, debated for a long time. So here is the um, main instability of higher uh, uh, dimensional MBL, or just a proposed mechanism for uh, possible instability of many body localization by the Roca veneers in 2017 and then the Roca Imbri. Uh, later the same year. Um, and the idea is the following. If you have disorder in the system, and here we, I depict a 1D system, then it's easy to think about higher dimensions. Um, there is always the finite non-zero probability of having a, 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 a contiguous set of uh, sites uh, of size LB, uh, where the disorder is consistently small. Of course, the, more, the, the larger LB, the, the less the probability, but it's non-zero. If this exists uh, and these have sufficiently weak disorder, we can expect extended states on this segment LB or in this domain LB. And um, we can reasonably assume that they will have some, if the system is generally weakly coupled to a bath or uh, they will be thermalized. But well, for whatever reason, if we assume that this LB is thermalized and satisfies the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, then one can write down a simple model, and I, I put the equations here for people who are familiar with it, but if you're not, don't worry about them. I'll describe the concepts instead, uh, which will be sufficient to understand uh, what was being done. The idea is that if you have this thermal bubble of size LB, and it's of course coupled through interactions with the rest of the system. GL is the range, is the interaction, and it's generally exponentially uh, weak in distance, so it decays with L exponentially, as shown here. Um, then this thermal bubble LB has a chance of thermalizing the other degrees of freedom. If it's strong enough to thermalize them, once it thermalizes another degree of freedom, that degree of freedom becomes part of the bath, and the bath grows. As the bath grows, its density of states, which is roughly one over, it's, it's uh, inversely related to its uh, size, um, will um, uh, will be will become higher, and therefore will become even even more powerful bath that will thermalize further degrees of freedom. Hence, the potential of an avalanche. But how do we determine whether the bath coupling to the other degrees of freedom, this bubble coupling to the other degrees of freedom? hybridizes them into the bath or whether it is not powerful enough to hybridize them or even could be back localized by proximity effect, um, that is determined by this so-called hybridization condition, um, which is a, con a parameter G that is the ratio between the matrix elements uh, in the coupling of the degrees of freedom to the bubble uh, over the level spacing in the bath, essentially, the inverse density of states. Uh, if this is very strong, this is uh, successful at hybridizing. If it's weak, uh, it, uh, it fails to hybridize uh, the system. And so we need it to be weak, uh, this parameter G, if we want MBL to survive. So what happens in if we, if, we, if, if we put in some numbers, there are ways to estimate this parameter G is generally related to, uh, sorry, the, maybe from this figure, uh, G is the typical coupling uh, between the, uh, so it's this coupling constant uh, between the degrees of freedom, uh, an energy scale for that. Uh, and then it's the square root of the um, density of states uh, and the, um, matrix element between the bath degrees of freedom and the degrees of freedom in the system. And so if we uh, assume that the coupling, uh, the interaction range is, is, is short range, it's exponential, and we think about how the density of states scales with um, the size of the bubble, um, for spin a half degrees of freedom, that's two to the size of the, uh, or to do the number of degrees of freedom inside the bubble. And then the hybridization stops essentially when this condition is met, um, which can be written down. Um, the point of, to uh, observe here is that the um, range of the interactions are exponential. Um, so the matrix elements uh, have this exponential character in them, but the um, 
density of states and therefore the inverse level spacing scales super exponentially in higher dimensions. And so in higher dimensional system provided that the bubble is initially large enough so that there exists this region. If there is no region, then the, it, it doesn't work. But if there is a region, then this condition is never met and thermalization never stops. In one dimension, however, you're contrasting one exponential with another. And so for large enough disorder, uh, the growth of the avalanche mechanism stops always. OK, if you allow me that as much detail as I would like to give, I appreciate that it's quite unsatisfactory. If people want to know the mathematical details, I haven't given enough. And it will be a matter to actually going and looking under the hood. But qualitatively, that paints uh, a little bit of a picture, I think, um, as to why, um, if we wanted to look for many body localization, at least this point in time that survives uh, to reasonably large system sizes and, and, and time scales, um, looking at quasi periodic systems was actually uh, a, an interesting next step. And in fact, people have been doing it in one dimension already earlier, just as a matter of curiosity. And then we, um, and uh, Anusha and um, uh, Sarang, uh, independently, we decided to, to, to go and look at higher dimensions. So um, if there are no further questions, I'll introduce briefly what quasi-periodic systems are, OK? Um, and then move on to what we have done. Let me start with 1D because it's the simplest context. The idea is to have a tight binding particle on a lattice. The lattice is a discrete regular uh, spacing of uh, sites labeled by J with a usual tight binding. And then we give it some potential UJ where I have taken out a multiplicative constant W so that the potential UJ is just between minus one and one and W is the scale factor. And then NJ is the density. And then I take uj to be also a regular potential. It's just a cosinusoidal potential. However, I take it with a, um, uh, a frequency, b, with a period, uh, that is incommensurate with the lattice. Therefore, since the particle can only live on the lattice, they will see a potential that is randomly distributed on this um, regular cos cosine, well, randomly not quite, but it's distributed in, in this quasi-periodic fashion. There is a phase factor phi here, which for all intent and purposes, you could set to zero. There is a reason why I keep it is because quasi-periodic systems potentials are deterministic. So if you study finite size systems, you have one realization of the potential. You cannot average over this order. In thermodynamic limit, you have uh, the usual um, self-averaging and, and therefore phi equals zero is a perfectly acceptable choice. But for finite size, in order to make the data look more similar to what they would be in very large systems, it's convenient to introduce a phase phi and average over random values of the phase phi, uh, which mimic this self-averaging in the large distance. So I will have phases in my picture, um, but from a point of view of conceptual um, understanding, you can set them to zero. From a practical point of view in numerics, we will use them uh, for that uh, to produce the data. Um, in this 1D system, there are no interactions at this point other than uh, the potential. So there is only a potential, no interactions. Uh, and it's known that uh, for W over T uh, equals zero, there are extended states, just a tight binding model for W over T going to infinity is clear that the states become localized. And in fact, one actually can solve them, the system exactly. And uh, even though it's not the topic of my talk, this solution is sufficiently cute that I think it's worth mentioning uh, briefly in one slide. If we write down the Schrodinger equation in real space for this system, and uh, this is what it looks like. Um, and I mean, it should be relatively familiar. And then what one can do is actually take the Fourier transform of this uh, um, e e equation, which is something also that we are accustomed to. But sadly here, we don't do the Fourier transform with respect to the lattice, but we do the Fourier transform with respect to the um, cosine period. So the spacing between the minima of the cosine. Uh, 
we still, I mean, it, it, it's a um, machinery, so it still works as um, equally to a, um, uh, just the same way as a Fourier transform, um, but it's just a slightly less conventional choice. Um, so we have uh, Fourier coefficients fk and this typical uh, uh, plane wave uh, um, description. Um, if we use, adopt this unusual definition of a Fourier transform, um, what happens is that the Schrodinger equation maps onto an expression that is shown here below, um, which is dual to the real space one. Uh, and we see that what happened is that the disorder now plays the role of the hopping in this uh, uh, band index k, and t plays the role of the potential instead. And the model is exactly self-dual when w over t equal two. And this uh, allows us to identify a, a transition in the behavior of the system. Um, we knew that at zero, uh, w equals zero was delocalized, w equal infinity was localized, and therefore w over two has to be a uh, change in behavior. Uh, has to be, uh, there has to be a symmetry with respect to that point. And in fact, if we look at localization properties of the entire spectrum here, we have the energy uh, spectrum on the vertical axis uh, and horizontally we have the potential W. Um, the parameter T is set to one. So at W equals zero, uh, we see the energy between minus two and two as we're familiar with the uh, tight binding bands. And there is a, cross, uh, um, a transition. And in fact, the states are extended up to the self-dual point, and they are localized to the right of it. And uh, the typical shape of the wave function psi squared as a function of position along the chain uh, is extended in the extended phase, localized in the um, uh, localized phase, and then has a critical point, uh, which is also subject of uh, uh, in study uh, in its own right. So that was the introductory part. And let me get to our results. I have introduced all the concepts we needed so that we can actually get to the results pretty quickly and see what the physics is that we, um, we uncovered. We take the aubrey andre model to two dimensions, but the same spirit holds. We have a regular square lattice uh, on which we superpose a wave cosinusoidal type potential. Um, we have some hopping j over two between lattice sites. Uh, in general, we will introduce also interactions V between the particles and the uh, Hamiltonian has the usual tight binding form uh, with interactions and the potential U, which is taken from two possible choices of this cosinusoidal mod modulation, which I call S for separable and NS for non-separable. Um, essentially, you can create this egg carton in two ways out of many. Um, you take cos x plus cos y, uh, or you can take cos x plus y plus cos x minus y. Uh, it's just a 45 degree rotation of, of the leading periodicities um, with respect to the underlying square lattice. Um, the two uh, Professor Castelnau, uh, excuse me to interrupt. Uh, there was a question in the chat, uh, Grigori ah, yes, asked, yeah, yes, uh, I guess regarding one, the Aubrey Andre model, does the model host multifractality only at the critical point? Yes, the, um, this, the Aubrey Andre model um, that I described here with the um, golden mean um, as the parameter B has this uh, exact self duality and it's critical or multi critical only at uh, W over T equal to. Um, there are other systems where actually uh, one can uh, realize more extended multi-fractal multi, uh, uh, regimes, um, but I, I will not be discussing them in, in this talk. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so we have this model and these two potentials. Um, the two potentials have interesting differences, but for the leading part of, for the, for the main results, they actually I, as I will show that they, they exhibit very much the same behavior. Um, and if we want to see what the separable and non-separable model are, um, one of the simplest thing is to actually just plot one realization of, um, uh, of this, uh, of this um, uh, potential. And by realization is one choice of these phases. As I said earlier, I have keeping, I'm keeping in the phases phi 
Uh, in this case, I have two phases um, because I have two cosines. And um, the reason is because varying the phases, I can sample the quasi-periodical potential in different portions of how it would be on the infinite uh, square lattice in the um, so the potential U is illustrated on the left for the separable model and on the right for the non-separable model. And we see that what can happen in these situations is that you can have weak potential lines um, where the cosines, so for example, in, in the cos X plus cos Y, you can rewrite it as cos X plus Y times cos X minus Y. Um, and you can see that you will be able to find somewhere on the lattice situations where one of these cosines is uh, near vanishing or exactly vanishing, as a matter of fact, if you're uh, allowed to sample the infinite space. And that will kill the potential along uh, x equal y or x equal minus y line. Uh, more straightforwardly for the other case, uh, you kill them along the x or y directions. And so this dotted uh, ellipse, ellipses show these um, weak potential lines. But otherwise, in general, the system is quasi-periodic and fairly uniform uh, in the sense that there are no rare regions, but there are these rare lines, should we call them, uh, of, of weak potential. Um, before we go to the interacting case, let's kill off interactions at V equals zero and look at single particle properties uh, where we can apply exact realization to fairly large system sizes and assess localization and delocalization properties by measuring, for instance, the uh, inverse participation ratio. This is a quantity that goes to zero for delocalized states and goes to one uh, for localized states. And we can do it for the whole spectrum uh, as shown here again, energy on the vertical axis and W over J on the horizontal one. And we see that for the separable model, we have what looks like uh, a clear edge um, and the transition. And below uh, we see what look the psi square in the top right panel here where my mouse is, uh, that would be the extended version, the, 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 how an extended state looks for the quasi-periodic system. In the intermediate intervening region, uh, this is what a sort of critical state would look like. And then localized states are really only have weight uh, of the wave function on a few sites. Um, for the non-separable model, the behavior is interestingly different. We don't see a, an equal, uh, equally well-defined um, threshold, uh, but we see what looks like more of a mobility edge. Uh, if we try trail the um, line that separates red from blue, um, we see that for varying values of W, you have a different values of value of E that crosses uh, where the eigenstates cross over from localized to delocalized. But in fact, there are some delocalized states that survive near zero energy all along. So the situation is more complex, but generally speaking, we have an in increase of localization as we increase W over J and the pictures look um, similar and also interestingly different uh, from the separable case uh, as illustrated here by looking at the behavior of psi squared. Um, if we want to look at many body localization, unfortunately, we can't rely on um, exact diagonalization because we would be then limited uh, to two small system sizes and we wouldn't be able to ex explore the entire spectrum. And so we have to look at different type of measures. Once we turn on W, we have to go back and look at something that I discussed earlier in the talk. And that's why I put some time back then, the notion of imbalance. You can think about, for example, initializing the system in some density of pattern for the particles shown here, illustrated in the picture here. And then you let it uh, a time evolve and you see how much the system is allowed to relax away from this. Um, and you can do it with a staggered density like this. But in fact, if you think about the imbalance as an overlap um, between the initial and uh, time evolved state, then you can clearly generalize it to any initial condition you choose, um, any density pattern. The reason why we change to this uh, quantity is because then we can apply a different technique rather than diagonalizing the Hamiltonian, we can actually just focus on studying its time evolution. And we can use the time dependent variational principle, um, which is something that actually uh, uh, Antonio de Postoc was um, brought as, as an expertise to Cambridge. And um, 
I will do my best to give a flavor of what it is, um, but um, he is the technical expert on this. Um, Time-dependent variational principle, essentially, it's a, a use of metrics product-based projective methods to um, study uh, numerically the time evolution of a quantum system. So the usual equation, dt psi equal minus i h psi, um, gets studied approximately with a projective uh, method based on matrix product states that allows us to reach, uh, to study relatively large systems up to uh, long times um, in a way that there are obviously many other uh, time evolvers numerically, but this uh, technique preserves symmetries and conservation laws. So importantly for us, conserves energy in a closed system. There's no trotter error, uh, which is uh, convenient and it's suitable for systems. It's, it's based on matrix product state. So it's suitable for system where the um, entanglement grows slowly in time. Um, matrix product states, remember, cut off the uh, entanglement uh, uh, content in a system uh, at a threshold where you're uh, doing the numerics. Uh, and in our case, at the very least, one side of the story is in the localized regime. And so we, ha we have a technique that is well equipped to study that limit. Um, and, and it also does a reasonable job when uh, uh, the system is delocalized, but at least it allows us to test the localized regime well. And so this is what we set off to do. Um, we took a system, uh, best size that we could do of uh, size 16 in the X direction and five in the Y direction. Um, and we initialized the um, initial state in a checkerboard pattern and we measured the imbalance uh, vertical axis as a function of time, horizontal axis, uh, up to 100 hop inverse hopping times, which is an experimentally sizable time scale uh, for a function, uh, as a function of different values of the disorder uh, in the different color curves, non-separable model on the top and separable on the bottom. And the beha behavior we observe is roughly similar. I has a bar over it because we are averaging over those famous phases that I mentioned earlier. What we do, well, we see some quantum oscillations we're not interested in. We see it decaying initially and then settling on to long time behavior that if we are lucky, maybe it is power law and it is reaching asymptotics. And so what we do is we fit the um, tail end of this uh, time evolution in these curves to um, power law behavior tau to the minus gamma. And then we plot the value of the exponent gamma as a function of disorder W in the insets of the two panels. We see that initially uh, for weak disorder, uh, this line is sloping down, correspondingly gamma is finite, and then gamma reaches a value very close to zero and uh, flattens out. Does this mean that this is localized or not? Well, let's look at it um, as a function of system size. So we keep LX equal 16, and unfortunately the best we can do is vary LY two, three, four, and five. Uh, and of course you can criticize this is a pretty small systems and I agree with that statement, but the scaling we observe is shown in these two panels and we don't see any major evidence uh, of this behavior drifting in size. So if we think that when gamma gets to zero and uh, between 15, 20, uh, uh, for, the, for a value of W over J around 15 or 20, uh, it doesn't drift and get larger and larger for larger systems. If we think this is a, a, a threshold between uh, delocalized and localized behavior, um, that where we would point our finger. Uh, and the system is so small that I would say, okay, how do I get convinced about this? My intuition was let's compare to um, uh, numerics for the equivalent disorder system. Say it's same size, but introducing disorder rather than a quasi-periodic potential. Uh, that's the best sort of we can do. And this is what we see. And um, we see that for the same values of two, three, four, five in the y direction and 16 in the x, uh, gamma decays to zero again. So we wouldn't have been able to tell the difference. But as a function of Ly, there is a substantial drift to the right, suggesting that as we go to the thermodynamic limit, the crossover from delocalized to localized goes to larger and larger values of w, suggestive that there may not be actually localization because this value of W diverges uh, within the thermodynamic limit. This is the best we could do to show evidence of many body localization. And at the very least for 
experimentally relevant system sizes and time scales, we do see evidence of localization. We can actually look under the hood a little bit more. I mean, maybe this slide is not as, as important, but let me look at this one. Uh, let If we look at all the curves for the imbalance for each phase individually, rather than taking the average, this is the scatter that we see. Some of them are very high valued and some drop down quite substantially, like the green one that I singled out here. And so we looked under the hood at each individual sample and uh, see their behavior. So for this green curve here, the top panel shows the potential. And we see that what we have is weak potential lines coincidentally in our system. Uh, it happens to be the top one, but that's completely random. And also actually a vertical one at um, site 12 uh, in the X, uh, along the x-axis. Uh, and then if we initialize the system in our checkerboard pattern and we time evolve it all the way to 100 inverse hopping time. So this is the bottom one is the state of the system as a in terms of density of particles at the end of our simulations. And we see that the system has well thermalized along the weak potential line, decently thermalized along the vertical one, but the rest of the system has retained a very, very visible memory of the initial state. We can make this, um, uh, well, we can see this again in, in, uh, throughout different time steps as it happens, um, uh, uh, illustrated for instance here. And in presence of weak potential lines, this happens when we hit a region of the system that there are no, where there are no weak potential lines, then the initial uh, state is highly uh, preserved. Um, and um, maybe the, this is most informative. We can actually um, look at the imbalance line by line. Rather than looking at the imbalance of the entire system, we can look at the, in, the memory of one line uh, along one line for each row, for each line of the system. So this is ij, and j is one, two, three, four, five in our case. Uh, and we see that if we plot the uh, value of this imbalance as a function of time, um, all the rows that do not have a weak potential line behave exactly the same way as if the entire system didn't have weak potential line, which is shown in the right panel. It's only the imbalance along that line that now decays. And so this is actually uh, quite suggestive of, of this, at least a very strong separation of time scales between the time scale over which many body localization dies out and the time scale over which you have transport along these weak potential lines. What happens in the thermodynamic limit and long infinite time limit? Um, let me come to discuss that at the conclusions, which are coming up soon. Okay, so this is the picture. I think I hope it's 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 uh, decently convincing of what we have seen, and so far we discussed the non-separable model. Um, we picked a, a given choice of initial uh, density wave pattern. Um, notice that if you pick the random initial configuration, the situation is very similar. And so if you have a weak potential line in the system and the random configuration, you see that all lines, the imbalance along all lines remains solidly uh, 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 fixed uh, and only the one along the weak potential one decays. Um, it's just that instead of so many quantum oscillations related to a nice periodic pattern at the beginning, a random initial state gives you sort of a, a clearer decay with fewer oscillations uh, along the weak potential line. So the picture is confirmed and tested um, and it's not an artifact of the choice of initial conditions. For the separable model, the story is the same. And so I will not um, give too much details, but there is uh, some interesting uh, difference in the fact that the, now the weak potential lines are diagonal. So the top potential is a realization where there is one, the bottom potential is a realization where there isn't one. If we time evolve, we see again that there is some distribution of weight along the diagonal that happens uh, with, while preserving the um, uh, initial state and memory uh, in the rest of the system um, when you have a weak potential line and, when, and none of this happens when you don't have it. Um, the subtlety now is that particles in our model can only hop nearest neighbor distance. And so thermalization and transport in this case are more difficult because a particle in order to hop along a diagonal have to hop, has to hop off 
and the perform at least a virtual process outside uh, where it will face some um, level of uh, potential uh, and, uh, and, and therefore some level of localization via that potential. And so there is actually some interesting modeling in, in that sense that can be done, but I will, uh, in the interest of time, I, I, I'll keep it, uh, uh, I'll refer people to the paper if they want to know. Um, we can look under the hood in this case as well, and I please don't look at this slide too much. I just want to say um, the same analysis looking at the imbalance along different diagonals gives the same exact outcome uh, that uh, it doesn't decay much away from weak potential line, except for the weak potential where it, uh, we, we see decay. So we see again this separation of timescales and this uh, um, survival of many body localization and presence of transport along the weak potential lines. Although transport in this case, as I said, it's further hindered by the fact that the system has to hop off the diagonals. Um, again, random state uh, doesn't matter. It's not a matter of initial conditions, but um, we have this uh, in cute modeling uh, of the motion along a diagonal that uh, I refer people to the paper about uh, that relates to what's known as a diamond chain uh, um, physics. Okay, so. I trying to keep to time. I'm already slightly over, but um, let me come to the conclusions. And um, I hope that I have shown in this work um, two results. Um, on the one hand, the fact that um, the um, many body localizations appears to uh, uh, feature prominently in quasi periodic systems in higher dimensions uh, as evidenced and contrasted to the, the behavior of random systems by looking at the imbalance. Um, this is in agreement with the results by uh, uh, Chandran and Gopalakrishnan um, with the caveat that we have weak potential lines uh, and they uh, could alter the effect uh, in the long time limit and thermodynamic limit. However, they also bring in something uh, very interesting in terms of physics, because we have seen that actually you can have transport and there is a clear separation of timescales over which transport and delocalization is established along the weak potential lines and the timescales over which, well, MBL survives. And at least to the extent that we can uh, analyze numerically um, up to scales that are of relevance to experiment, um, we see that the two phenomena coexist and many way localization is not spoiled. So I come to one minute of discussion of the question that I raised uh, uh, early on. What happens in thermal limit and infinite time? Well, if we take the avalanche mechanism um, somewhat face value and the arguments proposed by Chandran and Crowley, for instance, um, our one dimensional uh, weak potential lines are infinite. Therefore, their level spacing is correspondingly zero. And um, they will act as infinitely powerful bars. So if they were coupled to um, one point of the, of the system, uh, uh, they would integrate it as a bath. They would grow and eventually lead to thermalization. As they recognized, however, this is actually a very slow process. Uh, remarkably slow compared to a two-dimensional bubble embedded in two dimensions. And therefore that could explain our results. This is however, not the only possibility uh, because the avalanche um, mechanism neglects one, um, one possibility, which is the localization of the bubble itself by proximity effect. Essentially, the fact that you have um, a weak potential in 1D, but the particles can virtually hop off that line, they inherit disorder uh, from the neighboring sites. And that could lead to the vice versa phenomenon of the fact that, in fact, the system will be many body localized in the thermodynamic limit in infinite time and transport along the, the lines, in, in fact, at very large distances, curtailed by localization. Uh, and this will be a, another possible effect uh, and understanding whether this happens or not is, is, um, um, is currently under investigation. See if we can say something at least uh, in some effective models uh, that can be studied. Then it remains the third possibility, which is the least um, 
the, the, it would be the most exciting and, and also least likely is that they actually could survive uh, in the thermodynamic limit. Uh, that would be very peculiar, but it's uh, it would be, I suspect, very difficult to provide uh, proof, uh, definitive proof of, of, of it. Okay, with that, I thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to stay around for questions and, and discussion after. Thank you, Professor Castelnovo, for uh, this uh, interesting talk. Uh, let us thank our speaker. And we already uh, have a question uh, from Professor Aharoni. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, first question is, uh, is, there, uh, is it proven that the localization in the Aubry model is the same as for the general random uh, case? Um, so we're talking about... Um, uh, Single particle or many body? Let's start with single particle, then I'll move on. Okay. Um, so for single particle, what would you mean by the same? Sorry, I just want to make sure that it's I understand. A, are the critical exponents for the localization length the same? Ah, okay. And um, I'm afraid that you catch me off guard on this. I won't I, I don't know the answer to that question. So I would I wouldn't want to try and vaguely remember and then possibly give it wrongly. I am sorry. Um, okay. Yeah. Now, uh, moving on to two dimensions, these special lines that you get are, are special for the, for the Aubry model, right? Because yes. they rely on your, on your periodicity uh, in, in space. So the question is uh, the same. Uh, is that crucial for this model? And, uh, and would it differ from the random model? because of that. Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, okay, so maybe here I can say at least a couple of things. One is actually these weak potential lines can appear in quasi-periodic systems, but you can also make the quasi-periodic systems such that they don't exist. Uh -huh. How? So I have chosen, like the, actually it was Antonio's choice here to look at these ones with weak potential lines precisely because we wanted to see how they would interplay with localization. But I could actually, instead of putting the two cosines at 45 degrees, I can make their angle different than 45. Um, and then if you, if you look at this picture like here, when there are 45 here, uh, where my cursor is, and then you close the angle, you realize that in order to draw a line that is not on 45 degrees, uh, on a, on, a, on a square grid, you have to take points that are farther and farther away, depending on the angle, you know, with respect to the nearest neighbor distance. And so these weak lines now become very separated points in space. And you can actually distribute them out more or less at will. Uh, and, and, and this is the, um, so the, this is the point of uh, Gopalakrishnan and Chandran that you can actually do quasi-periodic systems where there's, there's no congregation of weak potential points, neither lines nor regions. That is the case where they argue, uh, they do a study and they argue that avalanche mechanism doesn't work and therefore uh, MBL might survive. I mean, not knowing that one mechanism doesn't work doesn't mean that then therefore you have many body localization, but it is uh, at least uh, pointing in that direction. The choice of putting these weak potential lines was a specific type of quasi-periodic systems that we wanted to investigate. And uh, it is peculiar to these systems and it's nothing to do with uh, disorder ones. In disorder systems, while the presence of a weak potential line is of course not impossible um, in the realm of like one can compute the probability, but it's ridiculously small, like, even compared to a rare region. And therefore we don't expect um, our results to translate into a, 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 a disordered system or be of relevance there. They are relevance only to this choice of um, quasi-periodic systems, um, unless there is some reason in a physical system where weak potential lines happen for for other, um, because of other phenomena. 
Okay, uh, last question. Mm -hmm. Are there alternative uh, numerical simulations of MBL in two dimensions, and can you compare with those? Um, I, as far as I'm aware, again, I'm, the expert is really my postdoc, but as far as I'm aware, um, the moment we're talking about interactions and higher dimensions, uh, the approaches are few and far between and time dependent variational principle is really the best performing uh, one that I'm aware. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, if I may add a comment on, on the single particle, Aubry Andre, um, it is known uh, already, uh, Aubry and Andre showed that uh, they calculated uh, that Lyapunov exponent is uh, given as logarithm of uh, what they call lambda over two. So lambda is the um, potential strength over the hopping. Um, so this is analytically known and uh, numerically uh, one can uh, test this with uh, transfer matrix, for example. Um, okay, um, perhaps uh, next uh, question is uh, Dario, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, a simple question. How much of this, let's say physics is preserved uh, or let's say is robust uh, against this order? I mean, if you, mm. if you add this order on top of the of the quasi periodic, how much of this is preserved? Mm. Um, okay, I'm hesitating just because I I think we actually tried. I was trying to say if I could answer it quantitatively, but I I mm -hmm. I don't think I can. But the but the best is actually to look at the panel in this uh, conclusion slide. Um, so you see that for size Ly equal five, mm -hmm. uh, if we look at the value of, so if we imagine that the disorder and quasi periodicity don't interplay too much, but they just give you, whichever gives you the fast, the, the, the less decay, that, that's the one, the, the one that gives you more localization widths essentially. Yeah. Uh, then you clearly see that for system sizes two, um, the decay in gamma is comparable between random and quasi-periodic disorder, this sort of purple um, set of data. Um, and so they, they would probably uh, interplay and it would be difficult to tell what's acting. But for L, Y equal five, uh, this order would only localize you for, you know, start to localize you around W equal, W of J equal 30. And in fact, okay. would give you pretty large gamma uh, before it. On the other hand, the quasi-periodic case for W over J mm -hmm. around 15, 20, depending on uh, the two models, uh, gamma is already very close to zero. So, and should so be robust. this would be heavily suppressed. Uh, and so it would dominate. Okay. I guess that's the best way I have to answer your question. Mm -hmm. We, if they if the two feed off one another, that's an interesting point. Um, I vaguely remember that we tried uh, briefly to put them together and look at the data, and we didn't notice for small disorder, random disorder, uh, uh, we didn't notice a major difference. But I, I wouldn't I wouldn't mm -hmm. be able to say anything more con concretely about it. I don't think we looked at it in to, in great detail. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, then uh, perhaps I have also a question. Um, so regarding these weak potential lines, is it uh, important that the potential is close to zero or just that it's constant? So, so what would happen if, if the potential is non-zero but kind of flat, more or less? Ah, okay. Um, it would be the same, except that in quasi-periodic systems, it cannot happen. I don't know if one can engineer some. Let me just get to an expression of the potentials. And then, um, so you see, let's take the separable model. Um, on the left in the slide, it's originally written as cos x plus cos y. 
The point is that you can write this as cos x plus y times cos x minus y plus a phase. Now, um, <laughs> for x equal y, you can um, so you can find specific values of x minus y that uh, kill one of the two, and therefore the other term doesn't doesn't work. But otherwise, if one of the two is constant, the other one will give it a modulation. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, in order to achieve constant non-zero value or non-vanishingly non small values, um, you would need to simultaneously make pi b x minus y constant and pi b x plus y constant, and then you cannot do it. So, but basically in this case, you kind of have like a 1D channel with quasi-periodic again, uh, or... Uh, in principle, yes, except that if you allow the... yourself to have a thermodynamically large system, you can actually make one of the cosines zero. And at that special value, then, Clearly, uh, you can make it as small as you like. And at that special value, you can make it zero. And th then the, the modulation, the, the prefactor doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So you can make yes. it as flat as you want, but only at zero. You cannot make it as flat as you want near another value, um, to my knowledge of, of quasi periodic potentials. I don't know if there are other quasi periodic cases that one can engineer. Uh, Obviously, you can just put a constant offset to everything if you want, but that's a bit boring. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah. But but in the case of the rare regions, uh, this would, uh, I mean, it just matters that it's flat, more or less, the region exactly. to, to have the avalanche, right? It yeah. doesn't matter that it's at zero. Yeah, okay, absolutely. thank you. You just need the extent, this, the, the, the typical states of the particles there to be extended. Mm -hmm. So that you can mm -hmm. then refer, like you can argue that eigenstate thermalization hypothesis holds, and then you can put together this effective model of the couple of the bubble to the bath, and then you uh, derive the avalanche uh, type mechanism. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have uh, another uh, comment or question from Professor Ahroni. In the, in the slide before the last, you said something about the diamond chain. Ah, yeah. But you were too quick for me. Can you? Oh yeah, I, sorry, I didn't mean to actually, like it was a teaser. I, I knew I wouldn't have time to discuss it. Um, the point is the following. So if we um, think about how transport happens along the diagonal in the separable case, we realize that in absence of second neighbor hopping, the particles have to hop off the chain and back on. And uh, if we assume that the states away from the chain are sufficiently localized, then really the only sites that matter are the diagonal and the two, um, what are they called? Three diagonal, anyway, the, the, the one above and one below. Mm -hmm. And if we look only at those and for, now completely forget about the rest of the system, then this behavior, write it horizontally, looks like uh, this diamond was known as a diamond chain on the right. And the kind of diamond chain is actually peculiar in this case because we have zero potential along the uh, central sides, label M, and then the up and down sides have these random potentials, uh, which don't are not necessarily very close to zero. But anyway, they, we can actually extract them and so, um, we can write down the behavior and the equations. And it turns out that there is a literature that I sort of vaguely refer to up here uh, of this diamond chain and, and transport along it in presence uh, uh, of disorder. And in the case of the um, quasi-potential lines, um, it turns out that actually the disorder on the upper and lower chain are exactly anti-correlated. If, if the above one is some value w, the one below is minus w necessarily. And, um, and so that allows us to write down and solve the problem um, in this chain uh, in, in an analytic way. Um, and, and that's like what we mentioned in the paper. And then essentially it allows us to understand uh, transport along this. And 
because of this necessity to hop out of the chain, uh, one thing that happens, for instance, is that if you have a checkerboard pattern uh, uh, initially, then there is no transport at all because either the sites on the chain are always all occupied, and then there are, of course there is no transport; it's a solidly filled line, or they are all empty, and but the op the sites outside are occupied, and therefore there is a blocking, and so again you cannot have transport. Um, but that was a trivial case. Uh, uh, the more general case of initial conditions give rise to some kind of interesting uh, physics. For instance, if we look at columnar um, density waves in the initial condition, then this line would be fully occupied. This, sorry, this column, this column is empty, this column is occupied. And so you see that you have an occupied side, occupied, occupied, empty, empty, occupied, occupied. And the particle has to hop in what's known as a zigzag pattern, where the disorder is on every other side. So these are sort of cute toy models that derive uh, from this study uh, in the diamond chain approximation. And that zigzag actually has, uh, has been known for a while. And, and, and coincidentally, I, there was a literature on it and, uh, and uh, people has, ha, have studied localization properties in this zigzag pattern and so on. Um, if we yeah. forget about the two dimensional aspect and keep only the diamond chain, are there initial states that would survive forever and some other initial states that will decay? We haven't asked this question generically. Uh, the answer is yes, but it's yes, in a, in a, unfortunately, in a trivial case. Um, because the cases we considered are cases where um, the initial pattern was chosen based on the 2D system, even though then we don't consider the 2D system, the initial pattern was chosen based on the 2D system. So if you start with a checkerboard pattern for the original system, and then you implement it on the chain, then that pattern survives forever, and there is no transport along it. So the system remains localized, but that's a matter of localization by blocking more than localization by, um, by disorder. So it's a combination of blocking and disorder in a sense. Um, whereas if you start with a columnar initial pattern, then the diamond chain is occupied. So columnar means these are empty, these are occupied, these are empty, these are occupied. And in that case, the motion is reduced to a zigzag chain that has a mobility edge. We didn't look at the problem generically. So if once one goes to the diamond, then there are perhaps more interesting initial conditions that is worth studying, but we haven't done it. The, the diamond chain without interactions has a flat band. Mm -hmm. The question is what happens to that when you switch on a weak interaction? Yeah, we, that, that's something we are still looking into it. Um, but um, some of these questions have been answered, but I don't remember. I, I, don't remember the specifically uh, the issue about the flat band. Um, so I would have to actually go and look at those references again. Thank you. Welcome. We also have uh, questions or comments from Alexei. Um, yeah, I have first a comment to what Dario was asking. So the interplay of quasi-periodicity and disorder, I think they actually do interplay because I, I imagine that if you so if you add disorder and you have a particularly uh, uniform region, it would still be happening on the background of the quasi-periodic potential. And so uh, it doesn't look like to me it would be, it would be thermalizing. Yeah, uh, actually, sorry. Like, uh, this is a very good point. And this is uh, like... Um, if you put strong enough disorder and quasi-periodic potential, then you are doing the best of both worlds in terms of trying to localize the system because the disorder will induce localization in the one, along the 1D lines. We know like mm -hmm. at least in the approximation of them being truly 1D, disorder would truly give them a, a, a transition to me many body localization beyond a certain value of the disorder. 
The weak potential, on the other hand, would kill the um, rare regions for the, for the disorder. So from a point of view of establishing MBL, if you put both of them strong enough, absolutely, they would, uh, they would resolve each other's weaknesses. From a point of view of weak potential, sorry, quasi-periodic potentials, I was mentioning that if you choose different potentials where the, they are not so nicely commensurate with respect to the underlying square lattice, then you can kill the weak potential lines anyway, so you might not need the disorder to achieve that. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a separate point. Okay, yeah. Another question, I mean, this is more of the numerical side. So um, I'm just curious, um, so I understand that you, you, you've chosen this uh, variational method because you had an expert in the group to do yeah. the computation. It is also one of the curious. best methods for this type of problem. So it's not, not just because it was an expert in the group, but yes. Okay, yeah. Okay, uh, well, that's exactly what I'm curious whether, I mean, the, the, the other approach I could think about is to use typicality, and I'm curious if you have any comments. Um, but typicality still relies on diagonalization. Uh, no, not really. Um, so sorry. I mean, essentially, well, can you remind? Can you refresh my memory on, on what the typicality approach entails numerically? Uh, well, actually, I think actually in this case, no. Probably you don't need typicality. I'm sorry, um, because you're simply computing. Essentially, what you need to compute. Correct me if I'm wrong. You simply need to time evolve your wave function, then act with the density operator, and then uh, sandwich. The, uh, the time of old wave function. Uh, exactly. Um, yeah, okay, no, you don't need typicality for that. I, I guess I should rephrase my question whether you could have used the, uh, the Lanzos or the Krilov methods in this case. Um, yes, but I, if, to, my, to the best of my understanding, um, the uh, time dependent variational principle can reach larger system sizes mm -hmm. um, and it has uh, there's accuracy so you're doing time evolution and if you use any method that rely on the eigenstates um, you will incur, incur a non-trivial error that is not immediately obvious to quantify well let me see so uh, if you don't do the full spectrum, yeah. you are cutting off some frequencies. So you have to make sure that those frequencies or inverse thereof are longer than the longest time scale, sufficiently longer than the longest time scale you're looking at. Uh, and I think yeah, true, but I'm... Yeah. Yeah, sorry for interrupting. Well, I, I didn't mean to uh, like to use Lanzer's methods to compute the spectrum and then... Uh... Uh, compute the partial evolution operator. I, I rather what I had in mind is computing, uh, literally computing the action of the evolution operator on the initial vector, avoiding the diagonalization. You can do that with Krilov methods. Ah, um, okay. Um, yes, now I understand. Um, I am less familiar with how performing those methods are. Um, in, in terms of what the literature uses, it suggests that people either haven't noticed that they perform well or they perform less well. Um, but okay. to be honest, I am not entirely sure. Okay, yeah, and a very naive question. Um, so what happens if you try to use Minfield? What would it give? Min Minfield in what sense? Because Minfield and disorder is not something uh, well, you could still decouple the interaction. I mean, Minfield to me is reducing the problem to a single particle. Mm. Because the, the, in my understanding, that's more or less what, what all mean field approaches in the end uh, reduce to. Yeah, so, so, you, so you, okay, so you're you thinking about just doing mean field decoupling uh, of the interaction channel and trying to. Um, um, I mean, the reason I'm asking is that I'm probably ignorant, but surprisingly enough, I haven't seen any statements about that. And I'm suspecting either things uh, failing so dramatically that no one even uh, I mean, one uh, no of the one problems I suspect is that uh, 
Okay, so what you're saying, like, okay, you could do mean field at the Hamiltonian level, reduce it to single particle, and then you could either compute the full spectrum. Now it's a single particle effective Hamiltonian, or well, I, I presume, yeah, so, I presume in this case everything becomes uh, solvable. If not analytically, then very efficiently on a computer. Yeah, exactly. So, so what you're... you don't even need to do time evolution at that point. You can literally go back and look at the IPR for for the mean field states. Um, I have not seen it done either. Um, because we know that these systems have localization, delocalization, uh, uh, transition mobility edges in the single particle picture, I worry that using mean field to decouple and turn it into a single particle equation would more or less would become a self-fulfilling prophecy that it will have necessarily a localization at large enough W and be delocalized as small enough W. And then, mm -hmm. so that's essentially a guarantee. And so therefore you would conclude that at mean field level, you will always uh, um, see this. And, yeah. and then therefore the predictive power in terms of seeing where localization fails uh, is lost, and, and maybe that's the reason why people haven't looked at it as much. Okay, and final question, uh, what about other um, non-random um, quasi-periodic potentials? Do you expect any change in the... Uh, well, this is a more generic question. Do, do you think uh, these results, yours and also the, the two other groups, are they sensitive to the type of the, uh, of the potential? So, uh, the one I could think of immediately is something like Fibonacci um, generalized to higher dimensions. Yes. So, um, absolutely. No, it, it, the things will change. Um, I mean, for one, as I try to uh, stress, the type of models that we chose here are peculiar in exhibiting these weak potential lines, which are non-generic. In fact, Chandran and Gopalakrishnan did not consider this, these cases. And uh, you can have weak potential, sorry, uh, quasi periodic situations where there are no clustering of any sort of weak potential points. Uh, and therefore, localization should be sort of, well, at least avalanche mechanism is ruled out completely. Um, and localization, they argue, survives. The choice of having these lines was peculiar and, and it's the only thing, like something we considered, but it's non generic. Um, then you can have yet other uh, types of uh, quasi-periodic patterns. Um, and I don't know if one can make general statement about what classes one might have. Um, Fibonacci is interesting because in 1D, it leads to extended multifractal uh, or critical phases. Um, in 2D, I think it's not, I, I would like to say that it hasn't been studied in, in any level of detail, but, but perhaps someone has done it and I haven't taken note. Mm. I don't think okay. so. And there may yeah, be- I also other. don't. Mm. I mean, all I know is that 1D Fibonacci has been studied numerically with interaction. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. And the claim is, yeah. Okay, yeah, thanks. Do we have any uh, further questions from the audience? Seems not. So in this case, uh, let us thank Professor Castelnovo again. And thank you all for joining.